Hi, I'm George Twill, uh, and we have another segment of What's Up with the Mendems, and uh, my, uh, my cohort, Kyle Schickner, is out on location today, so he's unable to uh, join us. And uh, I have a special guest here this morning, Anthony Panzera, uh, Professor Emeritus uh, from Hunter College. Anthony, welcome. Thank you very much, George. So we put together a few questions uh, for our audience that uh, we thought might be of interest to the Mendham people. And um, Anthony, when did you discover you wanted to be an artist? Uh, well, it's sort of a long story, but as a, as a kid, as a child, I was uh, always doing it. And uh, it was sort of fascinating to my mother that I could actually draw things and make them look like the thing. So she was very encouraging. Uh, in fact, she bought me my first set of oil paints when I was about uh, eight or nine. Really? Yeah, so I just kept at it, you know, and um, others noticed, uh, and I'm, I'm saying all of these things which sounds a little grandizing, self-grandizing, yeah. and I don't mean it that way, but the teachers were particularly interested in it, they saw the same sort of thing, uh, so they gave me extra time at the back of the room working on an easel, you know how they do that in grade school? Yeah, yeah. and it went on from there. Anthony, that's, uh, that's very interesting. Um, which artists inspired you, and uh, how did you discover them? Well, through the years, I got more and more interested in, in looking at paintings, looking at things, and of course, most of that was through books. It was years before I actually saw, really went to museums. But um, my mother had a book called the Encyclopedia of Paintings, and I used to pour through that all the time. Later on, after undergraduate school, and then graduate school. It was the Italian Renaissance artists that really interested me. So your mother had a lot of influence on you in those getting early started years. in the, yeah, uh, in those yeah. early years. Yeah, yeah. That was the cat just now. So, um, how would you describe your art? Basically, I'm a realist painter, uh, based grounded in in the figure, the human figure, which has led to many different things, aspects of what I do. Sure. But then I started doing. Um, um, landscapes and seascapes through my introduction to Nantucket and the Cape. I see. Um, then I started, well, a whole series of things, still lifes occasionally. Um, there are a group of paintings around here which you can't see now, but um, that ha all have to do with um, passing of time and death. They're called memento mori paintings. Oh, interesting. Yeah, interesting. So, um, how do you stay creative and productive? Yeah, yeah we, we sort of talked about that. It's what, when you get into school, uh, you learn how to do things. One of the things you learn how to do is to keep a consistent effort going. So, there's never any problem about getting up in the morning and going out to the studio and working. Yeah. And it becomes part of your, your MO from uh, an early stage. Yeah. Mainly it, mainly it comes about through the uh, ethic you learn in graduate school. I see. I see. And you had a, you had a studio in New York City, didn't I you? I did have a studio in New York City. After, uh, after graduate school, we came back to New York and uh, found this loft. In those days, they were giving them away because nobody wanted the loft. This was in the, in the late 60s. Wow. Yeah. Those were areas where they didn't, nobody, nobody wanted to live. Yeah, no, they weren't living. Really. But I, this was just a studio. Uh, I could never get my wife to live there, so. <laughs> so you had a, you had a little uh, studio there, and yep. um, did you uh, to 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 work at your craft? Um, you had you had models. Right, right. That part of what I taught at Hunter College was figure drawing. Yeah. So uh, it was a constant stream of models that came through at school. I also became uh, friendly with the man who was the booking agent. He was uh, doing the work for the um, the new school, right down in uh, around 14th Street. Uh -huh. Anyway, he sent me 
a whole series of models, not only from my classes in the beginning, but then to my studio. And that's how I got a couple of very interesting people to pose for me. Yeah, yeah. Um, anybody in particular that we might know? Yes. <laughs> yes. Her name is Madonna. Oh. It's the Madonna. You mean like the Madonna? The, the Madonna. The singer. That's, that's actually her name, Madonna Chicone. So, so how did that how so did that all come about? He sent her he sent her to me and uh, we got along great. She was terrific. She was a real professional about arriving on time, working hard. Um, and at the time I was uh, I, I was friends with a, a photographer by the name of Lee Friedlander. And he was working on a series of photographs where he photographed the models in their setting, at their homes. Okay. In fact, there's a terrific book out on it. Okay. Um, about a year or two after uh, she was no longer working for me, she got involved in the, in the movies. And she made this movie called Desperately Seeking Susan. I see, yeah. Anyway, he called me up and <laughs> one Saturday morning, so surprised because they went to the movies and saw it, and, and he wasn't sure that that was her. Yeah. And I told him it was. And it, that, um, those photographs that he took were eventually printed in, um, I checked it on this yesterday, in not only uh, Playboy, but the Hustler magazine. Really? Yeah. Wow. So and he made a lot of money off that. Yeah, he did. He did. Well, he's a famous guy. He should make money. <laughs> okay. But they, the, the press got a hold of that, and it was like a feeding frenzy. Yeah. They wanted to know uh, all about the modeling, so they somehow tracked her, her uh, background to the new school and this guy Robert Speller, and Robert Speller tells the people in the press, well, you ought to talk to this guy Pansera because he worked with her yeah. more than anybody else. Wow. That's pretty crazy. How old was she at the time? My, she was college, right? Yeah, well, no, she was out of college. Okay. Uh, she studied dance out in the Midwest. Uh, probably it was... Um, she was in her twenties. Okay, so that's a uh, that's a little uh, interesting tidbit. Interesting on, uh, story on the Madonna story when right. we when we go back and look at her life. Um, what advice do you have uh, for those who uh, dream of creating artistic works but don't know how to get started? Go to school. Go to school. Absolutely. You pick a college that uh, has a good foundation program to get you started, and then. When it's time to go to graduate school, go around to the different graduate schools, see what kind of work is being produced by the students and who the professors are. It means everything in the world. It really does. And do um, you, you feel that that uh, gives them a little uh, better foundation to uh, go out and you know maybe you know seek a job, a commercial art job, or well, something possibly, like that? Yeah. Possibly, but like I said earlier, it's that it, what what you develop is this ethic about doing it, doing it every day, sticking to it. So it's like a, you know, it's like working out, it's like a, it's a routine, it's a, but it's a work routine. Absolutely. Interesting, interesting. Um, there's a saying that those who can do and those who can't teach, uh, looking at your work, uh, that certainly isn't the case for you. What made you decide to go into teaching? Well, that basically was one of the big avenues open to me. Uh, yeah. After uh, undergraduate school, I taught for two years at an elementary school. And where'd you go to undergraduate school? New Pulse, New York, part of the SUNY system, State University of New York. Okay. Um, it was just a two-year job uh, because they didn't even have an art room. I had a little cart that I used to go around the whole oh, really? different classrooms. Yeah. Wow. Anyway, I realized that that wasn't going to be the, the thing for me to do for the rest of my life, so that's when I went off to graduate school and we all, my wife and I, and our young daughter went off to uh, Southern Illinois, spent two years there. Interesting. You're a professor at Hunter College? Former professor. Former professor. professor. Emeritus. I've uh, been retired now for two years. I see. So, um, so now that you're not working full time, you're pretty much working on your art? Every day. Every day yeah. you're in your workshop? Absolutely. In which we are at your workshop today, filming yeah. today. It's an awesome place. Uh, there's like a lot of interesting things. It's, it's terrific. It's terrific. Um, does uh, one have to be artistic to learn art? Well, it doesn't hurt, certainly, but being artistic as a child uh, is the inspiration to do more. People look at it 
they think it's interesting, as I told you about my mother, was always fascinated right. that I could do this. But it, it helps. It's not the only uh, determining factor. Uh, if, you, if you go in and you get through the foundation programs uh, and start to think more about how you can fit into it, yeah. it's the working ethic that makes it more happen. Yeah. So, like you told me that you have a, uh, a sketching uh, group, like group that yeah. comes in here on Fridays. Yeah, we were talking about the, the story in New York, my, my loft on 29th Street and Madonna. That was part of a, a ritual that I did every week. Every single week a few of us would get together uh -huh. and share the expense of the model. And I continue to do that now. So, so these... A couple of uh, uh, famous local architects who come and draw, a couple of local artists as well. I was going to say, the people that come, are they, they're not artists, they just want to... They are. They are they artists, are. but they, they had other careers. Yes. I see. Interesting. Well, so some, that's one way you can... Some, some have other careers. There are some that just make art. Right. Interesting. Okay. Um, speaking of uh, college, uh, what are some of your most memorable uh, moments in the classroom? <laughs> do you have a Do you have a particular yeah. story? There was one. <clears throat> uh, I started in about 1992 to take a photograph of um, my class with the model, nude model, uh, in the middle of it. Yeah. And on one occasion, the model, who was a terrific young lady, her name was Rainbow, she's a California girl. <laughs> in fact, I, I asked her about that. I said, how'd you get the name Rainbow? She said, my parents were hippies. <laughs> okay. Anyway, um, when the photographer would come in, it'd be pretty hard to get the students all together, grouped properly. Um, she said, what I'd like you to do is keep looking at me uh, try not to blink and think about something outrageous yeah. and the model says What could be more outrageous than me sitting here naked with all these people around me <laughs> and the class burst into it. And he took his photo So uh, we're actually fortunate that you still have that photo. I do. Oh, so would you like to see it? Yeah, let's <laughs> take a look at it here Go ahead. So uh, there you are. Yeah, yeah, where's the model? Oh, okay. Where's the model? So the model, yeah, <laughs> interesting. So the, every year at the end of uh, your school every year, year at the end you of get the, your class together. Every semester, actually. Every semester, and you take a photo. So yeah. that and is, then I would put the date on it. Yeah, know, sort of semester. just like with kindergarten, you know, first grade, second grade. <laughs> you follow your life. And That's right. Very interesting. That's a classic. Okay, so... Um, Are you guys going to get arrested for showing that? I don't know. We might have to... I'll have to talk to my producers. So what's, what's your connection to Mendham, and how did you come to have your studio here? It was a fluke. It really was. Um, we came back for, from graduate school. After that, after being in, in New York, and I, by this time I was at Hunter for about six years, right. I was able to take a year off. Oh, and, like a sabbatical. Yeah, sabbatical, exactly. And we moved to Florence, Italy, which was terrific. It, wow. was, a, it was a year that probably changed all of our lives. So yeah. The kids were small and they went to Italian schools. In any case, um, when we came back from that wonderful experience, we had to find a new place to live. Right. And my wife thought it might be better that we move out this way. This way schools yeah. at that time were better, and now, of course, the schools in New York are pretty good. Um, but um, we were searching around. We went everywhere up to... Uh, like New York State area? New York State area, uh, western New Jersey, and we were uh, staying with my wife's uncle and aunt who lived in Basking Ridge. Okay. Uh, and as we came down through from uh, Blairstown, we came along Route 24, we passed a house, there was a for sale sign on it, we called them up the next day and the rest was history. Wow. So that was, uh, that was over on Main Street? Yeah. In, uh, that was in 1976. 1976. Wow, that's terrific. So what makes it a good place for, uh, for artists? Well, I have to tell you, I really uh, enjoy the quiet. And it is quiet. It's very quiet out here. You have to remember, I, I commuted all those years. Uh, into Hunter into, College. Into New York, yeah. From here. From here. From here. Random, now that was yeah. it. I did everything. I uh, took the bus, I took the train, and then I started to drive. It, 
was, uh, but it was terrific. Yeah. It, it, having, being able to come back out here and sort of breathe deeply, and it, it's great having a space where you can uh, not have a lot of people around you. Spread out a little. Yeah. 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 Wow. Um, what do you like to do when you're not painting? Well, I do it all the time, so it doesn't leave much time. It's pretty much your passion. Yeah. That's what you like yeah. to do. But you did yeah, used to, Yeah, I used, to, I used to jog every day. Uh, you were a runner. Yeah, a runner. yeah. I did a couple of marathons, a whole bunch of half marathons, but uh, I don't do that anymore. I yeah. walk now. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We talked about, you know, the type of work you did. Yes, a realism. realism. And um, some of the things that you work professionally with, uh, you got involved um, with a, uh, a, cons a consignment? Well, uh, yeah, I had a number of exhibitions and then uh, through, through that process um, I met some people who did uh, contract work and I got involved with a, uh, a company called Rambush. This was Rambush. early on, yeah, after we got back here. And they basically did, um, they provided uh, artists to do work for churches. Oh. Everything from uh, making crucifixions, stained glass, uh, paintings. It was great. Yeah. So the first commission I got through them was to, it was at the time when uh, a priest from the 18th century, St. Uh, Martin de Porres, was going to be made a saint. Okay. And this Episcopal convent in Blauvelt, New York, decided that they wanted to um, have a painting of him. In the church in Blauvelt, they have this beautiful uh, uh, curved ceiling behind the altar, on which was painted um, all of the Dominican saints. I see. So they wanted me to add St. Martin to this group, and okay. I got squeeze him a couple, between a couple of other people. Really? St. Martin de Porres was an interesting guy because he was a mulatto, and uh, he was basically a, a acolyte, just, to, oh. just to take care of things. Inside the church? Inside the church. Yeah. And they had such a problem, uh, this was in South America, uh, with uh, mice getting into the, uh, the cells of the priest. Yeah. Anyway, he spoke to the mice and made a deal with them. Had, made them stay out of these spells. Oh, that, uh, is that how he became a saint? Well, it's one of the things. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, and then you, uh, then you had a, like a, a project up in East, uh, East Providence? Uh, yeah. Rhode Island. Yeah, that was another project. Uh, basically, um, it was a Portuguese community uh, in East Providence. Really a lovely church, but it was a new church. So I had to uh, take some images cross, a crucifixion, it was kind of an elaborate cross, not, yeah. not the kind that um, we're familiar with. You typically say, yeah. And I had to blow it up to about seven feet high, and there were balustrades that had to be okay. done. Those drawings were sent to um, uh, uh, Portugal, right? and they, they created these azuelo ties, which are blue and white. Tiles. Yeah. And there were a series, uh, and another little chapel, there were a series of saints as well, around what they called a radius. That's where the uh, tabernacle was. Well, interesting. So um, this company, you, you dealt with for a long time. Yeah, for a long time. Um, but then you get then you get here locally and um, you uh, you create a stained glass. The, the, uh, the doors for uh, St. Joseph's here in town. The it chapel was, area. It was at the time of the millennium and there was this uh, I, it was a suggestion that all of the Catholic Church throughout the world do something about the entrance to the church, something that's m memorable for the millennium. Okay. And so uh, Father Lash at the time um, invited me to uh, work on an idea with the, the Old Testament and the New Testament. And so there it stands now, if anybody yeah. wants to go see it, yeah, um, true. you can do that. And um, then you had a couple of local people, you did some uh, murals or... Well, yeah, that's right, I did. did a couple of local murals here in, in town. Um, and the other thing I did was a stained glass project with this same company for a stained glass window in, up in Saratoga. Oh, okay. Yeah. St. Mary's? That's right. St. Mary's Convent. 
they had a wonderful complex in uh, Westchester. Beautiful old stone buildings had been there for a hundred years, and they had a lot of acreage. And by then, the convent had shrunk. And so they decided to sell it off and move up to this area where they bought a lot of property. Yeah. They had a, a kind of a hospital-like setting, and they built a new church. But they took three of the stained glass windows from the old church and put it in, and they needed a fourth one. Okay. Uh, yeah. But they were unique windows because they were very tall. They were like 12, 15 feet high, and they were only about three feet wide. Yeah. And uh, it was the visitation scene. Uh, tell us a little about the uh, the project that you had down in North Carolina. Ah, that was terrific. Uh, I met some people uh, when I was on sabbatical living in Florence, and this fellow, Ben Long, uh, studied with a great uh, fresco painter in Italy, Pietro Anagoni. Uh, Anagoni was a great p portrait painter okay. and made lots of money. And then at a certain point in his life, when he was older, he decided he was going to just devote his life to making frescoes in churches all over Italy. Anyway, Ben Long uh, learned the process through him and came back and forth from Italy to the United States and he was from North Carolina. Okay. So he did a couple of these projects and one of them was this great uh, enormous fresco in the, in the back wall of the church, St. Uh, Peter's in, in Charlotte. Okay. And it was, uh, God, it was 40 feet high over 35 feet wide, and it was the crucifixion in the center, uh, the garden in Gethsemane on the right, and the other one was uh, the moment that the apostles speak to the masses and everybody understands what they're saying oh, okay. from the different yeah. countries. Yeah. It was quite a project. It took over two years. There's um, that whole uh, area in North Carolina. They have um, I don't know what do they call it a trail or something. That's right. You can follow. You can follow it around to all these different. It's the Fresco Trail. It's the Fresco. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And I guess small chapels or churches, all done by this fellow Brett Ben Long. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So you were involved in one of those down in Charlotte. That's right. Interesting. That was actually one of the first big ones that he did. Yeah. Interesting. So uh, you've you've had some exhibitions, yeah. And uh, yeah, tell us a little about the like the biggest one you've done. Well, the biggest one was the the latest one, which was the uh, uh, up was in the uh, Dansky, the Dorsky, Dorsky, the Samuel Dorsky Museum at New Paltz. That had to do with a project that I've worked on for a long time, three decades. Basically, it was when I was in Italy, I learned about uh, Leonardo, and one of the things that interested me were uh, his drawings and his notebooks. And in the notebooks, he talks about proportion, which was very important to me because that's what I was teaching right. at, at Hunter College. Yeah. Anyway, I decided to investigate it more, and I created this set of drawings, 65 drawings, on based on um, Leonardo's proportions of the human figure. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So you studied that, but you, you, I think you told me about how Leonardo used to write backwards. Yeah. In his was, diary, and you, you kind of took all the information out of that diary. Right. Yeah, he wrote backwards because he was left-handed. And, you know, basically they worked with pen and ink. And yeah. if you write pen and ink and you're going this way, you're going to smear it. Right, hand. right. So you had to use a mirror to read it, yeah. to translate it. I yeah, guess it was in Italian. Yeah, you could turn the turn the page to the mirror that's on the wall, or you can put the, uh, turn the book around and hold it upside down. Interesting. Very so, interesting. So you took these uh, measurements, right, and then you reproduced them. Well, I used them uh, to, I used them essentially to test the effectiveness of, of what he was saying. I so I would do a drawing from the model, uh -huh. model, model, and then I'd take the module, for instance, he talks about the uh, the proportions of the fed, the head, yeah. and he says you can break the head up into three parts, from the bottom of the chin to the nose, from the nose to the bridge of the nose, and from there to the hairline, and that's equal to the length of the ear, approximately. Interesting. Yeah. So, so what I would do is I take the words and see if they worked on my drawing, and almost all the time they did. That's terrific. So you did a few more, you had a few more areas where you, you showed your work. Yeah, yeah, there were, I had a, uh, a 
exhibition at the Everson Museum early on, the Dorsky Museum I showed with the gallery in uh, Nantucket and Boston, okay. Quidley and Company, and I also exhibit with uh, a local gallery, Studio 7. Okay, very good, very good. So all those years of that studying uh, Leonardo, you uh, you actually wrote a book. Yeah, yeah. What happened was after the exhibition, uh, um, SUNY Press uh, got interested in it, and they were terrific about it. And uh, we pulled all this information together that uh, I'd been working on and turned it into a book. Yeah. So there, there, there it is. is. <laughs> so it's quite an elaborate book. And um, I guess it was pub published in, uh, what, 2000? It was published in 2012. 2012, yeah. Uh, it's quite well, a Well, actually, 2013, because it came after the exhibition. Right. Yeah, so, the, great, the great part about it that eventually what happened is included the um, pages from Leonardo's notebooks. And they, some of them are tiny little pocketbooks like this. Others are uh, larger sheets. Okay. Some of them have drawings, as you saw. Some of them don't have any any drawings. It's just the words. I see. But the drawings themselves are just fascinating to look at and try to understand. So uh, this is quite a book, Anthony. How, how do you get a hold of one of these if you, you had some well, interest in it? Yeah. Do you have a website or anything? Yeah, there's a website. Okay. Uh, but you can get it online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble. So uh, a lot of your work is do you display it on your website? Yeah. Okay. You get a sense of what the whole uh, breadth of the, of the work is. That's terrific. Well, um, I have to say that it's been a pleasure to speak with you. It's been terrific. And I've known you for a lot of years, and uh, it's um, it's quite a career that you had, and. Uh, we hope that the people in Mendham uh, enjoy the uh, enjoy the show. Well, I certainly and, thank uh, you. If you have any information about Anthony, you can go to his website, which we'll display on the screen. And um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, George. By the way, the cats are equity people, so they get paid double. <laughs>